Amen. Amen. We're all right. Oh, I had a wonderful Father's Day. My son, who is pastor at Palms Baptist Church in 29 Palms, uh, invited me to come and preach in their services on Sunday morning. They have two services on Sunday morning. And uh, Pastor Rick said it'd be okay. Now, it was a wonderful experience. Only two things would have made it better, really. One, if I could have been two places at the same time, because I'm sorry I missed out on those three baptisms here. Baptism's always such a great time to celebrate a, a person coming into a full walk with God in Christ. And the other thing, it would have made it better if it was David preaching and not me. Because I would rather hear my son preach than hear myself preach. But uh, he seemed to think otherwise. In fact, David invited me to preach a particular sermon. Uh, and they were going through a, a theme, and some of the slides actually came from what they used last week. So you need to understand, they were doing a 50s theme in their sermon. So every once in a while you'll see something that looks sort of like a flashback picture. So don't, you know, you don't have to rub your eyes. They're okay. But uh, anyway, he asked for a particular sermon that he'd heard me preach. And it's a sermon that indeed had originated with his grandfather, my father. And uh, he was my longtime pastor. And I heard him share thoughts like this from this particular passage at least once every year. Because the matter of fact is, this was his New Year's sermon. He preached this sermon every New Year's. And it's very appropriate for New Year's. It's very appropriate for any time you're starting something new. In fact, it's just, it's just appropriate any time in your Christian life. So it's from Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. And uh, this is a passage where Paul has been thinking about reaching toward spiritual maturity, arriving at spiritual maturity. And he saw it as a process, and he described it in these words. Would you stand, please? Talking of that spiritual maturity, Paul writes, Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me His own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God. In Christ Jesus. May God add His blessing to the reading of His Word. You may be seated. In these words you will find Paul's recipe for a great life. Now last week with the 50's theme it's Paul's recipe for a swell life. Paul's recipe for a great life. Do you want a great life? How many of you want a humdrum, boring, and maybe even miserable life? Raise your hand, please. <laughs> no, I think probably that if the alternative is to have a great life, how many of you are in favor of a great life? Some of you don't know. <laughs> if you would have a great life, you need to apply these principles that Paul had learned. They work for him, and they will work for you if you put them into practice. The first is the point that you need to cultivate a helpful forgetfulness. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I don't even have to practice that with Pastor Dewey. I can forget like nobody's business. Right? Did you hear what I said? Helpful forgetfulness. There are many things I forget that I ought to remember. But possibly I remember some things that I've been better off just forgetting. Hmm? You like that? See, Paul himself saw a need to forget some things. They would not be helpful to him in his Christian walk. Yes, they indeed happened, and he was aware of them, and he remembered them, but he didn't remember them like he was always thinking about them. He was willing to put them behind him. If you go to the beginning of this chapter in Philippians 3, if you have your own copy of God's Word open there, and just 
flip back to the beginning of it, and you'll see what he's talking about. Some of those things that he had to put aside. For example, he had to put aside his own former false spirituality. He was a strict Pharisee. In the grand scheme of God's things, that didn't help one bit. He thought it did at the time, but he needed to forget that. He needed to forget the sinful excesses that he was led to in the name of religion. What he thought he was doing for God, and actually he was doing against God. He needed to forget that. You know, uh, Paul, by his Jewish name Saul, was sort of a, a guy high up in Jewish society. He needed to forget his former high place in Jewish society. He even needed to forget that he'd suffered a lot for the sake of the gospel. He needed to forget those sufferings. And here's why Paul could turn his back on these things, including some things, by the way, that the world would think were quite helpful to remember. Philippians 3.8, I believe you have it in your printed text, in the bulletin, it says, Everything else is worthless. It's from this same passage. When compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for His sake I discarded everything else, counted it all as garbage. This is a G-rated sermon. I can't tell you what that word really means in the Greek, but it smells. All right. Counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. So what are all the world's great highfalutin things? Garbage. Or that Greek word. That stuff that's nothing for the sake of knowing Jesus Christ. <laughs> all that stuff was important to me once upon a time. But it's not now. I'd much rather know Jesus. <laughs> now that doesn't mean that the past was of no consequence to Paul. The very fact that he could mention those things tells us that, that he was aware of the past. Paul was a man who learned from the past, but he did not live life with his eyes glued to the rearview mirror. Like in an automobile. You know, you're going to have a crash if you spend all your time looking in the rearview mirror. Once in a while, you ought to all check that thing. But if you spend all your time looking in the rearview mirror, you're going to forget there's something ahead of you, right? That's a dangerous thing to do, to drive that way. You can't be like Lot's wife, casting a wistful eye backward over the heaping ashes of Sodom. How'd that work out for her, by the way? She had a very salty experience, and not in a good way. <laughs> you can't go forward for Christ if you're spending all your time looking at your past. So we too need to forget some things. We need to learn this lesson from the Apostle Paul. What are some of the things that we need to forget? Well, I'll give you a list of some of them. You might even hit on all of these. But, but at least some of them, and you can probably think of more, are sorrows. And we all have sorrows in our life. You know, I, I, I sometimes remind people that the shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. I also notice that he didn't keep weeping. He was ready to move on to the next thing was, that was to happen. The next thing was to happen for him was he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead that particular day. But yes, he wept with those who were hurting. We need to forget sometimes our sorrows. It's not bad to, to weep or to mourn. It's bad to get stuck there and not be able to move forward. Sometimes we need to forget our disappointments. Have you ever had something that didn't work out the way you thought it would? How does it help if you just keep thinking about, well, if I just done thus or so, or if I just said this or that? You ever play that game in your head? If I just said this or that, here's what I should have said. Here's what I should have done. You know, there's no replay button in life. You don't get a chance to, to replay that thing and do all those things that you've decided a better way to do it. You might as well just set that aside. Sometimes we need to forget our little hurts. They could be physical hurts, they could be emotional hurts, but we need to forget those things. Sometimes we need to forget petty disagreements and differences. The stuff that upsets us is nothing compared to what Christ has put up with us. 
Sometimes we need to forget the grudges that we nurse. I'm sure nobody here nurses any grudges, right? I will not ask you to raise your hand. All right? How much does a grudge help you bear the fruit of happiness in your life? You bear a grudge against somebody. Who's getting hurt? Is that person getting hurt because you have a grudge? You're the one getting hurt. By bearing a grudge, you actually do damage to yourself, not to the person you bear the grudge against. And God would not want you to be immobilized like that. Don't carry those grudges. Perhaps you have some failures and shortcomings. Maybe even toward God. You've let God down. And the Apostle Paul can say, yeah, I know about that. Remember, I was, I was persecuting the church. Remember, I'm the guy that held the coats while they stoned Stephen to death. You probably haven't done anything as serious as that. But if you're Christian and human, you have disappointed God, right? Because none of us have reached full maturity yet. And if you focus on your failure there, and your shortcoming there, then you're not going to go forward. Sometimes we even need to forget the big ones, our disasters. <laughs> I love the story of Thomas Edison. In 1914, Thomas Edison lost $2 million worth of equipment and records. 1914, that's when $2 million was a lot of money. I know that's pocket change to a lot of you here, right? <laughs> But 1914, $2 million was a lot of money. <laughs> All right. In, in 1914, he lost $2 million worth of equipment and the records of much of his life's work in a fire that, that practically destroyed the great Edison Industries in West Orange, New Jersey. His son, Charles, found his father near the fire. His face was, was ruddy in the glow. His white hair was blown by the, by the winter winds. And Edison told his son, Go find your mother. She'll never see anything like this again in all her life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the next morning, he was walking around the charred embers of so much of his hopes and dreams. Edison, who was at that time 67 years old, said, There is great value in disaster. All our mistakes are burned up, and thank God we can start anew. When was the last time you really blew it? You said, Well, thank God I can start all over. When was there a disaster in your life? And you said, thank God, I've got a chance to start over. Well, I think that's a great attitude, really. Don't keep nursing those pains, those hurts, those sorrows, those disasters from the past. Oh, I like the serenity prayer. I, I, I've spent a lot, a lot of time with folks that are uh, alcoholics and narcotics folks and and they use this prayer a lot. But the prayer isn't really just for folks in that particular group that works for them. It ought to work for everybody. God grant me the serenity to accept the things that cannot be changed, to change the things I can change. Yeah, the wisdom to know the difference. <laughs> By the way, that prayer is attributed to Reinhold Niebuhr, who was a theologian. If you ever wondered, did any good thing ever come from a theologian? <laughs> oh, that's it. <laughs> there it is. All right, so the first principle is you need to cultivate a what kind of forgetfulness? Helpful forgetfulness. Forget those things that aren't going to be good for you. The second thing is to face the future with hope. How do you turn away from the past? Well, if there's sin, you need to confess it. Trust Jesus to forgive your sins and realize... That he has removed the sin. Now, I know we say, well, I, I, uh, I'll forgive, but I won't forget. <laughs> Would you like for God to apply that principle to your life? He says, I will remember their sins no more. He says, I have removed their sins as far as the east is from the west. I'm thankful I have a God like that. If there's sin, confess it. The Bible says, if we are faithful and just to confess our well, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, it might not be that you're classifying whatever's holding you back as sin. 
It might just be some of life's old accumulated garbage. Anybody have any of that? You know, we, we moved a little over a year ago. We have an amazing amount of stuff still in the garage and in the storage building that we bought to overflow the garage, you know. <laughs> and it's stuff I just can't bear to part with, or Sharon just can't bear to part with, right? We may not be able to, you know, get to it and find out what it is and enjoy it. <laughs> but we just can't bear to part with it. <laughs> Sometimes we have some old accumulated garbage, and if you're carrying around old accumulated garbage, if your life has become a garbage truck, you need to unload that stuff and ask God to help you to leave it all to Him. You can't change the past anyway. Don't cart it around. Ask God to take it. Huh. I said, you can cultivate a helpful forgetfulness. Why do you do it? Well, you ask God to help you. That's how. And then, having done that, having either, either confessed sin, if it was about sin, or dumped the garbage, if it was about garbage, then you set your direction toward the future. Here's Paul's example again. This is what he did. He did not dwell on the past, but he looked forward to what was ahead. And he did more than just look. It actually says that he pressed on. Some translations say he strayed toward the finish line for those future things in life. Did you know that the Apostle Paul was a sports fan? I know some people don't like when the preacher uses sports illustration. Paul did it quite often. But his favorite sport seems to have been the foot race. He often talked about pressing toward the finish line. He talked about finishing the race later in, in Timothy and so on. And the prize that was laid up for him having finished the race. This is an illustration here when he says, I press toward the mark. I press toward the finish line. It's an illustration of a runner pressing toward that finish line. And, you know, a runner cannot win if they have the wrong posture. I'll, I'll demonstrate the wrong posture. <laughs> Every four years, I become a track and field fan. In between Olympics, I don't care so much. As long as we feel the good team for the good old USA, by the time those, those trials and everything are over with, then I'll be a sports fan. I'll be a, not a sports fan, but a track and field fan. <laughs> I love to watch that, right? Well, I have actually seen in the Olympics, I've seen a guy that was winning the race and looked over his shoulder and the guy behind him shot ahead and won. Now you can't win a race looking backwards. So, okay, you forget what's behind. What do you do? You press forward. You keep your eye on the prize. You keep looking at the finish line. Where does God want you to be? Not where you've been, but what does God want for you? You press toward that. Paul faced his future positively, pressing forward. Now, why could he do this? Why could Paul do this? Why can we do this? Well, we have to have a high purpose in life. Without purpose, there's despair. Lord Byron, you all remember Lord Byron? Somewhere in high school English, you probably encountered Lord Byron. And you probably haven't encountered him since. <laughs> so some of us have to think a little farther back to remember. I, I, did they teach English in high school? Yeah. Now you may remember Lord Byron, the poet. Lord Byron once said, I go to bed with heaviness of heart at having lived so long to so little purpose. The occasion was his 34th birthday. Yeah. But you know, if you live without purpose, 34 years is a long time. If you live with purpose, it's just beginning. God has given Paul, and God has given us a hope, a future worth having. In fact, the best thing about the future is God is there. 
And that makes everything different. Paul made a supreme effort to be what God would have him to be. Look at verse 14 again, where he says, I'm going to find it, here it is. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. And we need to make that supreme effort as well. Now, the last thing I would say to you is, applying these two principles and one other, practice the art of concentration. Is a runner in the Olympics focused? He better be. He better be. In fact, he didn't just discover focus. The runner focuses on running the race well. And his attention is indeed on that finish line. But he's been concentrating on this moment probably for about four years. Maybe even longer. Maybe before the previous Olympics. He's gone through all the days of preparation, all the days of training. He's been thinking about this moment of pressing toward the finish line, his purpose, winning the race. Practice the, the art of concentration. Paul's concentration was Jesus Christ. He pressed on toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. He wanted to be what Jesus wanted him to be. He wanted to, to, to be... Pleasing to Him. He knew heaven was going to be just fine as long as He was pleasing to Jesus. We live in an age of specialization. Is that true? If you were needing brain surgery, would you want your general practitioner to be, you know, kind of digging around up there seeing what he or she could find? <laughs> See, I would really, if I needed brain surgery, I would really prefer to have a brain surgeon do that. Right? Last week I was preaching to uh, about half the congregation or more were Marines or Marine families. And I said to them, are any of you specialists? And nobody raised their hand. I said, you know, all of you Marines are specialists. Oh, yeah? Yeah. You're specialists in defending our country. You've been trained for that. I'm not going to pick up a gun to defend the country. I don't, I've never even fired one. Well, except maybe Disneyland, something like that, you know. Good <laughs> Really good training. <laughs> I want somebody that knows what they're doing <laughs> to defend the country. A specialist. There have been a number of athletes through the years who have tried to play more than one sport. There are none of them that have been successful, <laughs> even though they may have been very talented and, and, and wonderful physical specimens. But they weren't successful in two sports. They had to concentrate on what and not divide their attention. Listen, spiritually, we need to specialize and have an undivided attention. Jesus needs to be our specialty. He needs to be what our focus is. If we're not experiencing victory in life, perhaps it's because we're not really concentrating on Jesus. Now, I'm going to read to you a poll. I'm warning you, because my, my wife says this is the most boring part of the sermon. But I will tell you, in the last church, they were talking about this poll two days later. Think about it. Barna Research discovered in their poll that nearly half of born-again Christians, 47% agree, that Satan is not a living being, but is the personification of evil. What's my problem with that? And Jesus must have been crazy because he talked to him. Second thing, 31% of born-again Christians, those who identify themselves as born-again, believe that if a person is good enough, they can earn a place in heaven. Now what's my problem with that? Well, that whole cross thing where Jesus said, if there's any other way, let this come pass. And there was no other way. Jesus would have been a fool to go to the cross if people would just be good enough to go to heaven. Jesus was no fool. Third, 24% of those who identify themselves as born again, 
agree that while he lived on earth, Jesus committed sins like other people. How could Jesus be the sinless and perfect sacrifice for my sins if he was himself a sinner? The Bible tells us that he was at all points tempted as we are. Yes, he experienced temptation like us, and yet without sin. I'm starting to decide a lot, of, a lot of folks who call themselves Christians don't know much about what the book says. We are spiritually ignorant about what God has said. And we need to take Him more seriously and really look at what He has said about Himself and about life. Oh, get this one. 15% of those who identify themselves again as born-again Christians claim that after he was crucified and died, Jesus Christ did not return to life physically. The Apostle Paul would say, if there is no resurrection, I am, we are of all men most miserable. If Jesus didn't come back to life, then he did not validate all those things that he said. He said, because I live, you shall live also. The hope that we have is because He did overcome death in the grave. Now you have no hope if He didn't rise from the dead. And Jesus was a liar if He did not rise from the dead. You understand that? Oh. oh, here's one. This is going to be very popular in our, in our increasingly secular society where uh, almost... Almost 10% of people today claim they have no faith on cults, by the way. Almost. About one out of four, 26%, who identify themselves as born-again Christians believe that it doesn't matter what faith you believe because they all teach basically the same thing. Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Christianity. Now that says to me that the person not only doesn't know much about the faith of Jesus, they don't know anything about the other things they're talking about. Because those faiths are not consistent one with another. How can everything be true? Is everything you would take as good medicine, is it going to be good medicine just because you believe it'll be good medicine? If you take poison and you think it's going to be good medicine, is that going to make it good medicine? It'll kill you. And you'll die believing it was good medicine. Tell your dad. Here's another one. Roughly 95% of all Christians never in their whole life lead even one person to faith in Christ. Oh my. I hardly know what to say about that except we've not taken seriously what Jesus has said to do. I'll talk more about going and making disciples tonight. But he did say that, didn't he? Go and make disciples. Hmm. Here's another one. Although most believers say that serving the needy is important, just 34% give any time and or money to serve the poor in the last year. Wow. In terms of marriage and divorce, those who claim to be born again, and I'm starting to think the claim part is the big, big deal here are really no more likely than non-Christians to have a successful marriage. Now, I know that that's messed up because I know that people that are faithful to their faith have a great chance for a successful marriage. So, I think we've got a lot of people saying, yeah, I've been born again, and it never happened. Oh, number nine, the proportion who tied to their church was 8%. Number 10, Christians spend seven times as much time on entertainment as they do on spiritual activities. That probably says where our priorities are. What's the problem? The problem is that these positions are not consistent with what God has said in the Bible. The reason for this may be the next response, number 11, in a nationwide survey among born-again adults, those who claim to be born-again adults, None of the individuals interviewed said that the single most important goal of their life 
was to be a committed follower of Jesus Christ. Not a one. I think we've messed up our priorities. In a more recent survey, and I, I wrote about this in the current issue of the Hall, right? A more recent survey of American Evangelical Christians, Ed Stetzer of Lifeway Research, reported that fewer than half of the respondents, 48%, engaged in daily prayer time with God. And what's worse, only 19% read the Bible on a daily basis. Well, is it any wonder that we have a mess? I have a lot of people glaring at me. Some of you are thinking, well, those other guys are a mess. And some of you are thinking, he's a meddler. <laughs> Preachers are called to meddle. Listen, you cannot successfully run this race that is life. You cannot run it that is with joy and with hope if you are spiritually emaciated. Who is going to train for a race by starving himself to death? So that he's skin and bones... And he gets in the starting block and he can barely hold himself up. And yet, when we don't spend our time with God, when we're not praying with Him, when we're not, when we're not reading His Word, when we're not applying what He teaches into our, our daily walk, we're starving ourselves. Oh man, we're wasting away spiritually. You can't love God without knowing Him. And you can't know God without spending time with Him. So read His Word and talk with Him. Talk to Him about what He's showing you in His Word. Guess what? He will show you stuff if you have an open mind. If you go with a seeking heart. Oh, once in a while He shows me stuff I need to rejoice in. And sometimes He shows me stuff I need to get right. And maybe we never want to be reminded we need to be corrected. But you won't have the joy of being on the right path unless you get corrected. We must... If we would specialize on doing God's will, we need to give our undivided loyalty to the main task. Oh, we got a runner up there, don't we? All right. Notice he's not looking backwards. <laughs> All right. This is an old story, but it's true. A man entered a small shop that was the shop of a shoe cobbler. Now, you know it's a long time, but we don't call these guys shoe cobblers much anymore, do we? <laughs> a shoe cobbler. No, it doesn't have anything to do with the big uh, kind of a, a, pay, uh, a dessert that Grandma made. Okay. <laughs> that had shoes in it. It's a guy that made shoes, right? So, this guy entered the, the small shop of the shoe cobbler. He looked around. He saw religious signs all over the place. And he thought maybe he'd wandered into the wrong shop. And he asked the cobbler, he said, what's your business here? And the cobbler said, I work with shoes to make a living. But my business is serving the Lord. Believer, Jesus Christ must be our business. We may do other things. And yet all those other things have to take second place to serving the Lord. Think about this. Whatever you are right now in life, how would you identify yourself? A lot of times we do it by our profession or whatever, but however you would identify yourself, whatever you are right now, you're going to be that for just a short season. But whatever you are before God, you're going to be for all eternity. So experience hope and joy and victory as you make Jesus Christ the focus of your life. And those are the very things He wants you to experience. That's what He wants for you. So to summarize what I've said, Paul's recipe for a great life, cultivate what kind of forgetfulness? Helpful forgetfulness. Face the future with hope. And then practice the art of concentration. And who are you going to concentrate on? Jesus. Okay. Perhaps you're here today, and God has said to you, you need to get something right in your life right now. And we give you an opportunity to respond to what He's telling you to do. 
if he's telling you to do something, the right answer is always yes. I always tell you that. You know, because I don't want anybody to come because I asked you to come. But I don't want anybody to stay back there if God is saying you need to get something right and you need to come. Perhaps you need to come today to say, I need to express faith in Christ. I need a new life. Hey, that's great. We will rejoice with you and we will pray with you. We will help you make that step. Perhaps you're already a believer and you're, if there's something in your life you have to get right or maybe you need to become a part of this church fellowship or whatever it might be. What he's saying for you to do, the right answer is, Yes. Yes, Lord. I'll be here at the front to receive you as you come as Mark comes to lead us as we sing.